Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. My name is Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our show today is a celebration of the 24th annual Blackjack Ball. With us, our host and founder of the Blackjack Ball, Max Rubin. Also, we have the newest inductee to the Blackjack Hall of Fame, Anthony Curtis. And we have the winner of the Gross Gene Cup for outperforming all others during the 21 Question and Follow-Up Skills Contest, Arnold Snyder. All three of those men are in the Blackjack Hall of Fame, as is Richard Munchkin. I'm the odd man out here, in more ways than one, I suppose. Gentlemen, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Really good to be here. So, Max, we're going to start with you, because you're the f- person most associated with the Hall of Fame. Without going into great detail, please, you've had some very serious health issues. How have you managed to put on the ball in spite of those? Uh, by relying on family and friends, particularly Munchkin, who puts in at least half of the heavy lifting and keeps everything together from the invitations to who's coming to the absentee ballots, everything else, you for providing questions, um, James Grossgene for providing questions, my son who worked full-time for a long time on this, my wife who prepares lots of the food and does that, and uh, and my uh, daughter. And we had six helpers that were helping too. I couldn't have done this by myself at all. So it's I knew what we want to do, but uh, those people are the ones that made it happen, including you. Well, we're glad it happened. We're glad you're still around to be the general. And... Uh... <laughs> All right. And so the rest of us are your lieutenants, I suppose. So, Anthony, how does it feel to be in the Hall of Fame? Was it ever a dream of yours? And did you expect to win this? Um, obviously, it feels, you know, it feels good. It's a, you know, it's a great honor. Um, something that I didn't really think about for, you know, for quite a while. Because, you know, we've been doing this for for a long time. And... Um, I was never nominated even, so I, it's not something that I really thought about that was uh, supposed to happen or was going to happen. I just reckoned if uh, if I ever got nominated, then I would think about it. So luckily, a first time in, uh, that worked out great. But I'll, I'll tell you, here's the thing is once you do it, then you really understand it. You know, that's once once you're there, like when they, they call you and you go up and you have to address that that hall with all of those people who have been so great at this, you know, whether they were player, great players or they were, you know, were theorists or they had written books or, you know, whatever. And it begins to hit you. And when it really hit me was uh, when Ed Thorpe walks up and congratulates me and welcomes me to the club. You know, this is like the greatest of the greatest. I think all of us would say, you know, that Ed's the guy who started it. He's the most um, revered of them all. Um, Lawrence Revere, maybe more than more so, but no, I mean he's the he's the guy. And when Ed walks up to you and goes, "It's it's great to have you in the club." That's when it really hits me, and I went, "Wow, I should have been thinking about this more." But it, it uh, I'm making up for lost time. I've gotten a lot of congratulatory things. It's it's amazing what this has become because people were contacting me from all over who had heard about this. So it's it's a pretty big deal that I didn't give credit to until uh, until it happened. Very good. Arnold, you, yes, you won the skills contest. How does that feel? Feels really lucky. That's what it feels like. Because it, it, I really haven't played blackjack in years, and I haven't tried brushing up on my card counting or skills. Um, but uh, it is, there really is a lot of luck involved in in this. Uh, I mean, the the questions are are difficult. I mean, yeah, there's 21 questions, and the person that got the most right had 12. Yes. Yeah, so, it was a very hard test this year right, compared a, to other years. It right. Was, uh, so Much tougher than, than I, I realized going in. Those were the gross gene questions that gave him trouble, not the dancer questions, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Did you put those video poker things I in there? I did put the video well, poker. Well, see, I couldn't get those at uh, all. So, <laughs> so ha- had you... Um, have you been at the final table before? Uh, I, I was at the final table three 
previous times. Uh, probably the last time was quite a few years ago. Um, but I never, I never won, and uh, I think I hit, a, I had a second once. Uh, that was the one where I remember Michael Castellano crumbled up a card and tossed it into a hat, <laughs> where everybody else was trying to fly him in. Um, but uh, Didn't that you know, get disallowed though. Was that? No, no, no. He, he had, that in was allowed. In future competitions, it's the not rules allowed are now. He, at, at, there was no rule at the time. He did that. And because um, I thought it was a year or two years before where I just took the entire deck and threw it. And I know that was disallowed when I did that. That's so. a good one, too. <laughs> right. No, I know uh, Castellanos was allowed. And the next year, uh, I, I remember Max saying, OK, and you must throw the card as it is. You can't bend it. You can't fold it. You can't crumple it. You can't turn it into a ball. You know, and uh, well, this, this, that skills the contest has changed a lot over the years. You know, we oh, used to do I, a lot of other things. We used to, I mean, there were there were more pieces to it, and but there were things like like that. You know, throwing cards and putting and everything that had something to do arm, arm wrestling. wrestling yeah. yeah, until that guy broke my arm. I yeah. mean, basically, and then you know things have kind of morphed and changed over the years. Well, also we needed it to get a lot shorter. Right, yeah. because the competition used to take a long time. There were all kinds of crazy games we were playing. Mm -hmm. Max, any uh, particular that stand out to you that you used to uh, really enjoy of the uh, skills? I loved the chip shuffling because oh. we would have guys that are out there betting 10000 a hand, and they would have five, six chips in front of them. And they were trembling like a chihuahua with a bladder problem. They were uh, like this. It was so fun to watch these guys because, you know, they've got – they have no fear of taking on the casinos, but in front of their peers, shuffling chips, there was so much choking going on. It was awesome. But So I really like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think on the three times I went out, I went out every time on chip shuffling. <laughs> and, and the reason – I think it was in Ian Anderson's book, he said – uh, if you're a poker player, uh, you probably have learned to shuffle chips. Don't do that at a blackjack table. You'll look like too sophisticated of a player. You want to look like an amateur, like you don't know how to handle yourself. And so he put that, in, and I had never learned to shuffle chips. I had never played poker at that point. And so I always thought, okay, I'm never going to learn to shuffle chips. And I never did. And then we, we get to the, the, uh, the final table and that's one of the things. Okay, now see who can shuffle. And I, it's like I couldn't shuffle four chips. I could not get four chips to interweave with one hand. You know, so. 40 years ago. Uh, I can I do was, one chip real good. <laughs> 40 years ago, I was on a blackjack team with Bill Benter. And we went to him and said, Bill, you got to stop shuffling chips at the table. It looks too, you know, mm. you're, you're looking like too much of a player. And at the time he said, I don't think there, it's so ingrained. I don't think I cannot shuffle chips while I'm at the table. So he finally got over it. But So Richard, you don't get enough credit, but other than Max did acknowledge you pretty well a few minutes ago, but you busted your ass putting this together. You know, actually, uh, I beg to differ. I feel like I get more credit than I deserve. I mean, I take over one of the divisions of labor that I just is easy for me, and I know it's a nightmare for Max, is to take over sending out all the emails and getting all the RSVPs and you know, filling in the people who end up canceling. We had a lot of people who ended up getting sick and canceling last minute and having to fill spots. And I just don't mind doing, that's not, you know, a horrendous job for me and I don't mind doing it at all. And um, so Max, regardless of what he said, he still does the majority of the work. Now, one of the unsung tasks you got to do was the selling of Ed Thorpe's library. Tell our listeners about what that was all about. Well, Ed, um, I'm going to let Max talk more to this, but because uh, um, Anthony also helped out this year with that. But Anthony, do I mean, uh, Ed donated his entire gambling library to the Blackjack Hall of Fame. And starting a year ago, uh, we started auctioning off some of the books. And the books are really cool because a lot of them are signed to Ed from whoever, whether it's Stanford Wong or Lance Humble or Lawrence Revere. 
and and a number of the books include correspondence between them too. So, um, and if I may add, they're also embossed with the stamp from Ed Thorpe's personal private library, which is a pretty cool thing to have in a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you want to talk more about that, Max? Well, last year we had an extraordinarily generous uh, person who wishes to remain anonymous put up enough money because we are putting together a 501c3 and we're going to ensure that the Blackjack Ball and the Blackjack Hall of Fame survives all of us. And so we're going through that process and Ed put those up so that we could do this, but we had some very generous offers and now we've got some other people involved that are willing to put up a lot of money and help get this 501c3 put together and what we're going to do is utilize the money as our charitable foundation is that we're going to donate money to Gamblers Anonymous. So the card counters and the professional players in the world will have a charter that we are going to have a foundation, if you will, it's kind of a foundation, but uh, in which we support people with a gambling problem. And so we th- kind of think it's a perfect kind of symbiosis that it we're is. doing that to help others. Yeah, maybe not specifically Gamblers Anonymous, but charities that involve helping people who have gambling addiction problems. Right. We're not sure how that's going to happen yet. But uh, that's kind of how it started. And Ed was, you know, extraordinarily generous with his books. And uh, so he's also, he's kind of like at Barona where everybody's comp for life. If you're in the Hall of Fame, well, he's comped at the Blackjack Ball for life for having donated his library. Including his wife and kids and grandkids. Yeah. And you know what? God bless him. God it's bless him. I, I got to sit with him a, a year ago. Really nice people. That was one of the uh, things happened at the table we were talking about that I got to write about and things. And it was one of the high points of my life. He's class act all the way. He is. And his grandchildren are all at MIT. And it just no, Some just only made it to Cornell. And the other one who oh. was there was at Dartmouth. So oh, they, that's they, terrible. Yeah, yeah. they, they kind of d- fell too far from the tree. Yeah. All right, now, Max, uh-huh. we're going to ask you a question, and we want the three-minute answer, not the 40-minute answer. <laughs> that has to do with usually a bottle of Bel Air champagne goes to the winner of the Gross Gene Cup, which is Arnold this year. Now, we got a picture of it at the uh, ball, but the bottle itself did not show up. Uh, at that time. So can we give you the three-minute story on that? Is that possible? Sure. Uh, Don Johnson is the representative for Luke Belair and Ace of Spades, other champagnes, and there are three white bottles in the world. They just put them together, and he sent it to us on Thursday a week ago, a week before the ball. Sent it on the Thursday, and that was the balls on a Saturday. So on a like Saturday. So it's supposed to have been there in a couple days, right? Well, the and he also sends us many cases of champagne and bamboo rum and that sort of thing. So that stuff came. Those came. And they said the other box had arrived in Las Vegas. So we said, okay, great. It'll be delivered. Then we call and they say, all we have is an empty cardboard box. So we get a hold of customer service back in Memphis, and they say, oh, we see the bottle right now. Not the box. They see a bottle. But they didn't ship it. Somebody tried to steal the damn thing. There's no question in my mind because it was outside of this box that you're looking at right here. And then we didn't get it for the ball. We didn't get it the next day. We didn't get it the next day. Now it's Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., and my wife's just walked getting out of bed Ding, ding, a guy comes up and just drops that at the door and takes off. And the bottle is trashed, it's scratched up, it's torn up, and it says it was originally shipped on Monday. It was not. It was originally shipped on Thursday before, and they've just flat lied to us. And so we're going to do an investigation because they do a lot of business with these vintners. And so we're going to try to figure out what happened. And not sure how far we can go with it, but uh, we were clearly lied to. 
And okay. I brought the box just so you could see. They said it was shipped on Monday before it was I not. I got a feeling that all f- the other four of us in the room believe your story, Max. So we don't <laughs> well, need to, yeah. to we got it. post it. Well, Good. so does Don, and Don was unhappy. Good. So Don Johnson Arnold, do supplies this. Do you now this. have the bottle? Yes, he does. Uh, yes, I do. I finally got the bottle. And are you going to drink it or are you going to leave it untapped? Well, I know that there's uh, only three in the world. I think the advantage play would be to sell it. <laughs> uh-huh scratches and all well spoken pete <laughs> well here's here's one thing if you want to drink it you got to drink it because uh, i won one a couple of years ago and waited a little while and uh it um was a little bit past its prime so if you're going to drink it you got to drink it he left it room temperature too you need to keep it chilled yeah. oh, if you're going to keep it intact champagne does go bad does your office air conditioning in the summer on the weekends and stuff um yeah for the most part yeah but no <laughs> for the you most know part. it's look you you just can't store champagne you know that long champagne is well, not something in that, that really giant ages. bottle it's a 15 yeah. liter bottle so yeah. it's and it just escaped you know i mean the whatever it is in it is co2 or whatever it is i don't know what they put in champagne to make it bubbles but it got out <laughs> so uh-huh. let's just put it that way it, the, right. the dogs got out on that one so arnold in addition to the bottle of champagne Gro- James Grosstreet stood up and announced he had a special gift for the winner, and it turned out to be you. We know it was a thumb drive inside of what looked like a nicely tooled leather book. Can you say the what book was- looked like? It was out of Harry Potter or something. Yes. The it was, can you are you uh, can you say what was on the thumb drive? Yes, uh, it was um, uh, charts. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And uh, there's a, uh, a program. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, until then, I'm waiting till, uh, to get some uh, more instructions from James. I, can, uh, I know. Uh, okay. But, <laughs> I, can talk, I can talk about this a little bit. Um, I'm, all right. So, you know, the cool thing about the ball is everybody – I mean, there's a lot of cool things about the ball, but everybody gets together, right? We haven't seen each other in a year. You know, sometimes longer, um, and everyone everyone gets to hang out. You know, before, during, and after. Well, after I got to hang out with uh, James Gross Gene a little bit. He came to the office. Well, more than a little bit. When you get together with Gross Gene, it's hard to get away. But uh, we spent five or six hours actually uh, a couple of days after the ball. And what he gave Arnold was the beta, basically a pro- not a prototype, but I'd say the beta of a program that he's putting together that we are probably going to publish at Huntington Press. So that's why I can speak about it. And it is one of the most fantastic uh, uh, computer software programs you'll ever come across. Essentially, it will analyze just about any kind of game you can ever run into that uses Table cards. Game. Yeah, yeah, that uses cards. You know, with, with you know, both poker and blackjack uh, derivatives. And it will not only... Will not only tell you what the edge is given the rules. You just got to you know punch a bunch of things into it. It will tell you basically how to play it. It'll tell you if you play it in different ways. You know what that will cost you. It will tell you if it's uh, if it's uh, uh, if card counting can beat it. Uh, It'll devise count systems yeah, for different games. Yeah. Give you index numbers for yeah, those count systems. Yeah, and this is going to be something. And uh, uh, James and I talked uh, at length about how we would do this, and we would uh, definitely have a free version of it. That would be up at, you know, LasVegasAdvisor.com. Now, this isn't, we haven't decided we're necessarily going to do this, but this is something for people to look forward to if this happens. And then there'll be different levels of it. Some of it you just can't give away. It's just too powerful, and there'll be a price on it, and, you know, pros will definitely want this. Another thing that this could do is game developers who spend, I mean, incredible amounts of money with mathematicians would be able to cut through so much of that with this device. And, um, and Arnold got it because he won. But uh, but I can tell you, James is really happy because he has a really good beta tester who will know what to do with it. And I can also tell you there were certain people, had they won, there was a second flash drive. (laughs) Oh, I didn't know that. That didn't have quite as much information on it. And the reason that I didn't say anything is because James said... Uh, keep this under your hat or something to that effect. And, and you uh, didn't say anything. You you <laughs> did reveal there were charts. All right. So let's talk about the Hall of Fame voting. Uh, the candidate list, um, nine people, pretty impressive, uh, five of whom have been on the show. Uh, one who hasn't, Lance, is never going to make it because 
he met the uh, the big blackjack dealer in the sky. <laughs> so Anthony Curtis, Blair Hall, Cat Hulbert, Lance Humble, Maria the Greek, Mark Billings, Mike Michalik, Norm Wattenberger, and Richard Doherty. Doherty. Doherty? Doherty, yeah. Also, we should mention that the the whole Hall of Fame process changed this year um, to become kind of more like the Baseball Hall of Fame, right? So we end up with nine candidates, and then you have to reach a certain percentage of the votes. So there may be years in the future where no one gets in if they don't receive a high enough percentage of the vote. And it's is possible. That, is that how that worked this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so I didn't know that. I thought this. I thought this year there was a different voting process, but it was just whoever got the most. But we had to reach a, a threshold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, genius, uber genius, Wally Simmons is looking at this from the same aspects that they do for the. NBA Hall of Fame, all of the rest of them, and coming up with some models up after this so that we will be able to determine if somebody is indeed worthy. And there might be a year where two people make it, possibly. Right. Pop- but there may possible. be a year where nobody gets in. So it's it's going to be interesting, the lobbying and whatever else goes on. So, uh, but, but he's building some highly sophisticated, and, you know, he's a world-class programmer. So he's, he's taking this under his arm and under his wing, and he's going to uh, do this for us and pulling all these pieces together. So second and third place, uh, Mike Michalik and uh, Maria the Greek, their score together pretty much equaled Anthony's. Anthony ran away with it. Now, would their score have been high end enough had um, Anthony not been nominated? Do you know? I don't think it would have. Okay. I don't believe well, it would have, but what, we don't know where all those extra votes would have gone. That's you know, true. So it's kind but, of hard yeah, to say. So you don't know where they're distributed. But what I did find really interesting is that Mike Mahalik rarely gets any votes. And we went to this model in which you can bet three times. You bet for three people. And you vote, not bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you three, vote for three you have people. three votes out of, yeah. And all of a sudden, Mahalik moved up in the kind of the stratosphere because he was kind of in humble territory and we were thinking about well it's been so long and he's never really gotten very many votes but once we took it into three he got a lot so he's the second or third choice of a whole lot of people yeah that's pretty good yeah and uh the guy who won this year anthony spoke up and said if he had one vote he'd vote for mahalik so that's uh i like Mike's chances next year. Yeah, well, it's a, it's an interesting thing about Mike. A lot of people don't really know who Mike is, and and he's done so much for the you know in the blackjack world, uh, playing with Tommy Highland's team for a long time. And um, when I actually you know I told this story, I'll truncate it here. I told it you know when I accepted the the induction or whatever you call it, but I didn't I didn't know this until years later. I knew who Mike was. I'd heard all about him. And found out years later that he and I went to the same high school at the same time in Dearborn, Michigan. We didn't know it. Neither one of us we neither one of us knew each other. And years later, we didn't know until we sat across from each other at a dinner and started talking. Going, wait a minute, hold on, you're from where? And you know, one. So both of us were walking, you know, the halls. And you know, my my line was, I wasn't even best in my own high school. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Mike did some amazing things, and not only in um, not only you know, he did a lot with shuffle tracking, he did a lot with other things, but also sports. You know, he worked on sports models, and a very talented guy. To really help his chances, he should go on that podcast called Gambling with an Edge. It didn't hurt Bob Nersessian. It didn't hurt you, Anthony. I'm pretty sure that would help him. Mike's got a Mike's had some illnesses, and yeah, you know he's, he's had some very serious health issues. Yeah, and he's you know he he has some some problems, uh, you know making appearances. But I'm telling you, when he was when he was when he did his thing, he was he was something else. All right, the game of 21 questions. Um, I wrote bunches of them. Max wrote bunches of them. Richard wrote some. Uh, Gross Gene wrote the tough ones. So, um, Anthony, which one was your favorite? Or do you have any favorites? Um, favorites? Jeez, I don't know. I mean, my Tricky. favorite would be the one I would know that nobody else did, and I don't think there were any of those this year. I didn't find my card, so I don't know how I finished, but I think I finished like with about, what made it last, 10 or 9? 
nine. Nine was, uh, was the playoff. I think I finished with eight. And so, I don't know. I, I, I guess I guess my favorite was probably, you know, again, the ones that I thought I might know that nobody else did. And one of them was about how many blackjack tables there were in downtown Las Vegas. And uh, I got that one. I didn't think a lot of people would get it. So, I liked that one. Actually, I had a favorite question. If you would hand me the, sure. the list there, Max, I will read it to the listeners. Okay. Because uh, usually I don't have a favorite question, but uh, this question really uh, tickled me. And that question is, you're a BP in a casino where no one knows basic strategy at all, so cover plays are unnecessary. The dealer has a two-up, you hit your hard eight and make a 16, and your beast of a whole card spotter tells you to stand. Which of the following is false? The dealer could have a two in the hole. B, the dealer could have a nine in the hole. C, the dealer could have a 10 in the hole. D, as a BP, my job is to follow signals, not try to infer what the whole card is. Or E, they are all true. Um Anyway, I particularly like that question. I expected a lot of people to pick E, uh, that they are all true. I particularly like the answer D. As a BP, my job is to follow signals and not try to infer what the whole card is. Um, but uh, the actual answer is uh, C. If the dealer had a 10 in the hole with a 2 up, you didn't have to worry about cover. You would have doubled down on your hard 8 against a 12. So. Uh, yeah, that was a good question. Actually, I like that one. I got I got that one right. That was it's, one of uh, James Grossman's questions. Yeah, that was a, that was a good one. There was the other one about the about the hat walking in with a hat and you know all this sort of thing. Like you were going to some Indian reservation thing and can you wear the hat and do you need a player's card? And it was on and on and on. That was kind of amusing. But, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. didn't get that one right. <laughs> but it, it basically asks you: you go into it, and you only have five dollars, and you want to turn that into a fortune, and you're not going to do anything else. So, which of these will ensure that that can happen. What additional bad news will you have to tell about this plan? This is for an 18-year-old nephew. That An 18-year-old nephew. A gambling age there is 21, so you have to find a different casino. There's almost no chance of finding a $5 game at the Indigo Sky. And the beauty of these that James writes is you have to be a road warrior to know these things. You have to be out there playing. So you've got to be playing. So even Because if he, he mentions the Indigo Sky Casino. Right. So. so even if he finds a $5 game, he'll need to give his ID to get a player's card. And then he said casino security might ask him to remove his MAGA hat at the door. And the Indigo Sky is only slot machines, no table games. Well, the answer is 18-year-old wearing a MAGA hat would be welcomed at a $5 game in the Indigo Sky in northeast Oklahoma. But where he would get stuck is that unless you have a player's card, you have to spend 50 cents more to play a hand of blackjack. And if you don't show your ID and have that, you can't play $5 blackjack. Each hand costs you 50 cents more if you're not in the club. And you have to be 21 to get the player's card. No, uh, no, 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 no. 18 just 18. Just 18. That's then. it. It was just because he only he only has five dollars, so he didn't have enough money for the juice. Well, but so why he could couldn't he get a player's card? He could, but he, he could. didn't like it. Well, he said, which one of these was the bad news? Because the guy didn't have yeah, a player's card. Yeah, which one is card. the bad news? The bad news is that you unless have to, you You get, have to give up your ID. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. To get so the player's card. That was a good one. Um, one I like. Well, I like. I always put Just in. Hold the mic up okay. Another one I like. I always put in something about Barona, about uh, could be a little tough, but because all of you agree not to play there, that's why we host this party, and you don't come down, and that's a wonderful thing. But uh, now we generally have the most full pay pitch 21 games in the world. And that's a fact. But because we will, they'll never have to worry about 6-5 blackjack. We will never have that. No casino has ever marketed now offering 6-5 blackjack, which is insane. You know, they, they can do 7-5s, but whatever it may happen. We, we forget all about that. But Oh, 6-5 was marketed by Bally's years ago. Big yeah. signs at we the have corner. Single of, deck, six five. Yeah, Boy, it's better it. back. No, by popular demand is what <laughs> yeah. they. That's what they. That's what they put. They really wanted it. So, so I just asked the question: Which of these blackjack games is not being played at Barona? Blackjack switch, dragon blackjack, down under blackjack, zap it blackjack, zombie blackjack, or double deck free bet blackjack. Nobody got it right. They all said zombie blackjack. 
Not true. Zombie Blackjack, you get your two cards. If you don't like them, you can throw them away and get two more. So they come back from the dead. And the one that we do not have is Dragon Blackjack because it doesn't exist. And they all missed it. It was so fun looking at the cards. Did you get it right? No. No. I didn't get it. I, no. I quit Zombie Blackjack. So yeah, <laughs> most people did. So that was a fun question. So Arnold, yeah. you know, clearly you hated the video poker questions. Yeah. I'm writing about it in this week's column for those of you who want to know what it is, but Arnold doesn't care. So which one did you like the best? All right, yeah, uh, well, Anthony said that uh, uh, he he always liked a question that he knew the answer to and nobody else would. And there was one question that I knew the answer to, and uh, I knew anybody else that got it right either would have guessed or they would have read a book that I wrote 14 years ago, or they would have spent a few hours in Steve Forty's library, probably a few days. And uh, the question was, uh, what was the uh, game, uh, the original game that uh, morphed into our current game of blackjack? And uh, it was something I, about 20 years ago, I, uh, I was very interested in the history. And um, and I knew Steve, he had an incredible gambling library, and I was talking to him about it, and he said, well, I don't know the answer, but why don't you come over here, and I got all these old books, and you can, you know, uh, just take a box of them home, look through the, you know, and I did. I took a, took a whole box of wow. these, and I mean, some of these books are from the, the, the 1900s and the early 20th century, um, and, uh, and I, um, I just went through these books until I actually found the, the answer to where did blackjack come from? And it, it was a game that was uh, played in both Italy and Spain. Uh, it was Instead of 21, it was 31. But it had the curious feature of the ace could count as either a 1 or 11, and it was a gambling game. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of information about exactly what the other rules and and you know whatever was on it but there was enough there that you could see this is definitely the precursor where the game of black so i knew that because i had spent that time and i don't i doubt anybody else again if some people had read the book the the, the big book of blackjack that I, was published in 2006 uh, they might have uh, they might have gotten that one right. But. See, I didn't deserve to get there because I should have known that too. Because we, our book, The Art of Gambling, through the ages, the uh, the uh, uh, the paintings. You know, uh, I wrote all of the history of the you know where these games came from, and I know I wrote that, but I didn't remember it. Yeah, you got to have it on your fingertips. And I did have it at my fingertips because he brought me his big red book of blackjack, and that's where I got the question. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so he got that. Uh, Very good. Yeah, so we had some really fun questions. The last one, you know, we've got all these hybrid games that are out there now. Blackjack Switch, Blackjack This, Blackjack That, and they're all these Jeff Hall games. So if the dealer busts with a 22, then everybody pushes if they still have money on the layout. So... They, they do get to blackjack switch, all the rest of those. So the question was, and James came up with the math, what are the odds that if the dealer has to finish out that she's actually going to bust with a 22 on a hit soft 17 game? What are the odds that's going to happen? And within 1%, they had to get it, and most people missed it miserably. It's 7.35% of the time. That's a lot. People don't understand that. Oh, well, how many times are you going to bust with a 22? It's one in 14. The house makes some money off of that. Yeah, those are good games. But the players love them. They really do because they think they have an edge. All right. So we had um, five people. The top five scores, actually, there was a, a runoff between uh, Arnold and Rob Wrightson and R.J. Ryder Top Dewey. For the last two spots, they had to name a state where they had legal blackjack. And they went through several rounds, and Rob uh, said Texas. He did. And I put and a Max rule says, in for the down. first time, <laughs> is that if you missed, you're out. The person behind you doesn't have to get it right. So if you're wrong, you're out. And he said Texas and raised his hands and went, Rah! and I said, no, thanks. 
sorry, they don't have it in Texas. He said, but they used to. I said, that wasn't the question. It was what has it, what has it now? So he missed after on his second time through and then. Todd and oh, it was quite a bit more than two yeah, times. They've gone through yeah. more than two times, but yeah, yeah. three times, possibly four. But All right, there's so, a lot of states with gambling, so we're going to go through the final table and stuff that happens. And before we do that, we're going to take a brief commercial break. South Point has more than ten thousand games, returning more than ninety nine percent. This is more than anyone else has. In March, the promotion is for players who get mailers with free play, and it is called free play with the kicker. Pick up your usual mailer on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And if you do, you'll receive the same amount to be picked up Friday or Saturday. Pick up all eight of these, and Monday, March 30th, you get a double free play amount. So normally, instead of getting four mailer amounts, you will get ten. The March 10th free video poker glass is free progress is Progressive Deuces Bonus. There are two independent banks of quarter games with progressives at the South Point. It's a 98.8 game uh, at reset, and they both have 1% meters, and they grow up rather quickly. And so very frequently you'll find positive games there. We're going to teach you how to play it. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, you get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Stack the Deck. This is a seven coins per line game where on dealt hands of trips, quads, full houses, and four to the royal, you receive from three to five extra cards which is the exact card you need to make the hand. That is dealt 33366. Three, three, Instead of having one three remaining to the quads, if you draw to it, you now have six threes out of 52 cards, giving you plenty of chances for quads, five of a kinds, and quads with a kicker. They have extra pay schedules for a baby royal, which is the nine through king suited, and five of a kind. Since the game is fixed as seven coins, sometimes they have to change the pay schedule to make the game within acceptable bounds. So you will need to work out the strategy for yourself, but it is possible using available software. We are back. Okay, the final five. The first player, the first contest was to estimate the number of cards in a discard tray. Richard surreptitiously handed me a stack and says, count these and tell me quietly. <laughs> so I counted them twice and gave it back to him. So we got a number. So they all wrote down their number. And the guy who was worse is named Dustin Cummings. None of you have heard of him. He came in with Jelko from Australia. He never played a game of blackjack in his life. Before the, but he did really well on the test. He he, he aced the test. He did better on the test than anybody else. Well, not, which, no, I think no, he was first. Oh, you're right, you're right. He yeah. was first. So Jelko and Dustin come up to Richard and say, "By the way, he's never played blackjack in his life. How does he win this final table? How did you respond to that, Richard?" <laughs> Uh, well, basically, I said you have no chance, but I, I did tell them, you know, what they what the various skills were going to be. And I don't know if Junko was going to try to teach him to count cards or cut in, you know, three minutes time or something. So, uh, yeah. So, and, and yes, he was eliminated immediately at the final table because, as you say, he had never played blackjack before in his life. We've kind of seen that through the years is uh, some strange people get to the final table. But I was it, one of those. <laughs> Uh, Bob Nersessian's wife, Thea Sankowitz, was one of those. Well, and Bob Nersessian himself. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bob it, passed. The, he, he actually got to the well, he second actually place took, once. He, he took second once, yeah. which is but, – but that's, you know, again, it, usually that final table sort of separates them. Once they get right. there and they get to the skills, because there's always a card counting thing and there's always a, a cutting thing and there's always something that's going to kind of separate the, the, the beginners from the, the guys who have done it. Well, what's astounding is Todd Dewey. 
isn't a blackjack player. He's the sports beat writer for the bad beats and all that with the review journal. He got to the finals table and he wound up taking third because and he could very easily have uh, been second or first. Uh, yeah, it, with just a little with, with, with some well, luck, a lot of luck. But, well, we'll discuss it. He yeah. came extremely close. Yeah. You know, before we say anything, who doesn't get enough credit is, is uh, Richard Munchkin. Who, you know, won this thing three times and wouldn't let him do it. And, you know, they wouldn't let him play anymore because he was so good at the skills at the final. I don't know how many times I took second, probably because of you and James Grosjean, two guys who took, who won it three times a piece because their skills, you know, in on the street were just so good. And they're, they're an example of where things get separated when you do get to that final table. Yeah. One of, and one of the skills that is no longer there, um, which maybe we should bring back is is memorizing cards. Um, that was there you know, three or four years ago. So it's a yeah, change. Yeah, yeah, we up. used to do it. Well, um, that one's a tough on me because a lot of guys are drinking champagne, and they're at such a disadvantage compared to the guys that don't drink. Well, but compared to guys who have memorized cards in casinos, those are the, I mean, those yeah. are the people who are at a disadvantage, yeah. right? I mean, either you've, you know been involved in plays where you have to memorize strings of cards or you haven't. So. Right. True. Yeah, you were always really good at those. I was not very good at those. And, you know, that always hurt me in the in the past. But twice, twice, I was down to, to win it on the final hand, and they were tournaments. And they were, we were dealt. We played a tournament on the final hand, which is supposed to be my main area of expertise, right? And twice, I lost both of them. Well, uh, tournaments have a luck, a luck factor. Of course. Well, I knew. I knew I was drawn dead. When I saw the way the cards came out, I already knew like I couldn't win on, on both of them. I was like, I can't win unless this guy does something terribly wrong. And I would try to induce that, but that didn't happen both times. But, you know, Max, you're saying, you know, that there's a lot of people drink, which hurts them. But, you know, there are a few people I'm aware of who actually practice this stuff in case they get to the final table. Now, they haven't yet. But if any of those people like James used to practice oh, yeah. every year, you know, um, I really didn't. But um, but I, I'm aware of other players that are still practicing. They just haven't made it to the final table yet. But when they do, they're probably going to win. The next contest was having to do with cutting a card. The Richard would have a shuffled single deck, although it didn't need to be shuffled. Put a five of spades at the very bottom of it and give the people a cut card one at a time. Say, we want... We're going to cut it wherever you say. We're going to burn the top card, and we're going to deal out however many spaces you want. And you have to get as close as you can to making this five of spades the dealer's whole card. Now, this is a different way of phrasing cut 15 cards. Cut 15 cards is so much easier. The only reason that I don't say cut 15 cards is because if you cut 13 and you know that you've cut too too short, I w you should be able to hit by just removing one hand from the table, right? Instead of six spots, if you say just deal five spots, well, now you've nailed it. And if you do that in the casino, you've made an enormous winning bet. So, so that's why I didn't want to limit it to exactly 15 cards. Then make it 13. No, but no, no, no. I, because the skill is being able to see how many you've cut and adjusting as the on the fly. This, you have to read and say, "I'm high." I'm we can't low. hear you if you're not well, holding the mic. Yeah. If if you look at the dealer's hand after you've cut, you can see the cards in his hand, and then you estimate, "I'm either high or I'm low." So you may have cut seventeen, and then you're going, "Oh, I'm tr I'm dead," or you might say. Uh, 13, I'm going to go low. We're only going to play five spots. So they didn't have to announce how many spaces until after they cut? Correct. Because I, sometimes if you're skilled at this, you can let a civilian cut and judge how many cards the civilian cut and and use that information to your advantage. Uh -huh. So that's why, I, that's why I don't specifically say cut 15. And that's why he's running this contest, and I had no idea that all that was And that's another one. Listen, listen to the jargon, a civilian, right? You know, I mean, and it just comes out so naturally. You know, I was when I was talking with Grosjean after the party, as I mentioned earlier, you know, he uses these things all the time, civilians. And, you know, when you're out there in the Blockies. wild, that's what he says, <laughs> in the wild. I've seen them in the wild, you know, and I mean, it's, it's so funny, the, the different terms and nomenclature, you know, at, at, this, at the pro level. 
So everybody did about the same. Three of the people cut, missed by three spots. And David Y. missed by four spots. So he was out. But it was all, you know, pretty clumped tightly together there. Right. But see, if any one of those people had just said, deal one less spot, they would have won. Right? Because because now four would have gone to two away. Or three would have gone to one away. You know? So it's really about your eye as much as it is your hand. All right. Second spot. Second from the end, now we're down to three people, was to... Count down a double deck. Count down a double deck. Now, when I get to the final table, which is not going to happen, but when I do it, I'm going to use the ace-five count if, they're, if I'm not forbidden from doing that. It's... You will be. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So um, Dunbar, who's written some hand analyzers for both uh, blackjack and video poker, uh, was the fastest of the counters, and he was accurate. Arnold and Todd Dewey, really close to tied for the uh, for counting it the fastest. When Arnold had finished, he didn't put all the cards down. He says, well, the number I have over there is. So this indicated, yes, he had finished with what he had done. But at that point, Todd had only one card to still count. So it was really close, and Richard judged that Arnold was faster. And so uh, Todd and Arnold and Todd both got the wrong answer. But since Todd was the slowest and the wrong answer, he was out. Had Todd been a second faster or just realized he's not good card counter and just quickly guessed, then Arnold would have been slower. And Arnold would have been out. So. And he told me he was just guessing, and he just didn't didn't occur to him to go faster because he could have pulled a move we've seen several times where a guy will just take the deck and go, yeah, that plus uh, two. Yep. It's your only shot, right? That's what I did, and it happened to be minus four. But uh, it was close. <laughs> I was fast. <laughs> so, um, so Arnold and Dunbar go on, and uh, – Todd is eliminated. But Todd could have survived that hurdle. Final one was, was I think is an impossible one, was James Grosjean has one inch square of the centers of picture cards. Uh, the Queen of Spades, the Jack of Hearts. Well, all the picture cards. And you have to identify them by suit and by uh, rank. When we did it last year, the average score was negative. This year, Dunbar went... F- got graded first and had four plus four is his score, wow. which is a hell of a score. Arnold shows up with plus eight. So which is better score. And did you practice? Explain how you did it. I I had um, never practiced. I looked at those things and just said, well, this is going to be a luck fest. Um one of the things I noticed, uh, if you still have those uh, those boards with the cards on them, you will see that in the uh, in the uh, patterns, some of them have tiny clubs, some of them have tiny spades or tiny hearts. So, yes, they do. And also, there was no uh, there was no penalty for not putting. Uh, I mean, for putting a wrong suit. The only penalty came when you got the 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 rank of the card wrong. So right off the bat. My thinking was, okay, I'm going to put a suit on every on every single one, and these ones that I can see a suit in the pattern, I'll put that suit because I'm I'm guessing if they have a club in the pattern, it probably was on a club in that card. Um, as far as the cards, I just I mean I just looked at the pattern and I tried to like expand it in my mind, like oh it's probably a jack, it's a queen, it's a king. And, um, and did that's you know really beforehand that all the jacks have? blonde hair i knew nothing in fact and, i didn't even know there would be tiny spades or in clubs in the pattern uh i just when i looked at it i went oh gee there's a club in there okay that's a club and it's immediately i started looking for that within the pattern um but no otherwise it was it was pretty much luck ex- unless somehow i s- mentally expanded the cards correctly 
to what they were, but it, it wasn't because I knew any tricks. So. I didn't watch this uh, either. You know, I went it three years ago, and I wasn't on yes last year, and I wasn't on this year, so I didn't watch it. I was doing other things. But this, what is this, a whole card? This is a whole card uh, exercise? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Okay. Yeah, because sometimes... I, we didn't say. I reckon the audience would like to know. I assume it's a whole card, right? Right, right. Because sometimes you only see a piece of the card, mm -hmm. and you you want to be able to identify a card, seeing as little of it as... As possible. Okay. The dealer squeezes the middle, and that's all you can see. But you got to have really good eyes to see it that fast and know what it is. But uh, some people can, and you, I hope everybody got the ace of spades right because there was yeah, a, that was a, yeah. There was yeah, a hive there was one with bees on it. Yeah. <laughs> that was tough. So that was the twenty fourth blackjack ball. We have winners here, um, and now we're funded, so they should go on indefinitely. That's um, longer than anybody here. Yes. <laughs> the um, Thank you all. Now, at the end of our shows, Richard and I have a category called Recommended. Richard, do you have something recommended for our audience? Um, yeah, my recommendation this week is a blog by R.X. Gamble, who's been on our show a couple of times. And she had a blog post that started out to be about the blackjack ball, but quickly veered off onto all kinds of other things. But the reason uh, I'm recommending it is because she got into talking about how she in investigates games that other people don't investigate. And she doesn't do her own mathematical analysis, but I think it's good for listeners of this show who are interested in advantage play to read it just because it gives you a mindset about not accepting conventional, conventional wisdom about things when you're told that game can't be beat and to investigate things that people tell you, you know, you can't beat that game. And just because somebody says it on the Internet doesn't make it true. So... Uh, anyway, that's my recommendation. How do you find it? Well, I, I uh, subscribe to her blog anyway. Yeah, but you know so, what I'm saying. How, oh, how oh, 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 I, I think it's rxgamble.com, or if you just Google rxgamble, you'll you'll find her blog. Yeah. She's on Twitter as rxgamble, too. And my recommendation has nothing to do with gambling. It's called storycore.com. That's S T O R Y C O R P S dot com. I learned about this from a Matthew Dix newsletter. This is set up as an interview process for two people. Usually one of them is an older person, and 40 minute taping, and it puts on file at the Library of Congress, and this is free. And what this is, is if you have parents who are about ready or grandparents who um, their words will live on in case you want their kids or grandkids or whatever to know what grandpa Bob said years ago. So this is a free application. Should you have somebody in your life that is, um, it's that time. This would be uh, a good thing to do. And this wraps up our show. I want to thank all of you, Max, Anthony, Arnold. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>